Welcome back Troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Today we're going to check out this little guy, the Rickenbacker 325 model, more specifically the C64 variant, and that just simply means a reissue of the 1964 Spacs. So just a little bit about Rickenbacker history, I don't know everything, but apparently they made the first electric guitars all the way back in 1932. But Ricks, I mean, they're mainly known for their 12 string guitars because they have an intelligent headstock design on them. Essentially what they do is they take the same six string headstock style, so it's about the same length, but then they add the other tuners to the edge of the headstock right here. It's just so ingenious the way that they do that. They've essentially just blended a classical style slotted headstock with a regular electric guitar to get all 12 strings on without making the headstock ridiculously long like Fender and Gibson does. But then you have this very substantial looking headstock with tuners <laughs> sticking out everywhere. But I personally find those things really cool. And the other thing about these Rickenbackers is the basses. They make some really looking fancy German influenced basses. But this is a company that is proudly everything made in the USA, kind of like Gibson. But don't worry, not all Rickenbacker guitars are tiny like this one, but this particular variation has a very famous user that has made it incredibly popular. It's John Lennon. I didn't know that before I had bought this guitar because I don't really have a nostalgic thing with the Beatles. I know who they are. I know they've made some great songs that I still listen to yet today. The first time I ever knew I was listening to the Beatles, it was actually an orchestra class. We learned the song Eleanor Rigby, and that's just a fantastic masterpiece. But his was actually from the first batch in 1958 and that first batch did not have the F-hole design on it. So that's why whenever they reissue these guys, they usually go for that variation. So if you're looking to buy one of these things brand new today, it's probably because you're a Lennon fan. But since that didn't really excite me too much, I was very pleased to find two other guys that I do know about that also use these guitars live and in the studio. So we've got John Fogarty of CCR. His was the fire glow finish. He's made some modifications to his though, like a humbucker in the bridge and his truss rod cover reads Acme. And Maurice Gibb of the Bee Gees has also used one of these live since the late 80s until about the early 2000s. So that just goes to show you, it's not just John Lennon early stuff with the Beatles. There's a bunch of stuff you can make with these little guys. And I keep calling it a little guy. I mean, how much smaller is this compared to a regular guitar? It's a three quarter size instrument. Most of the specs online call them a 20 and three quarter inch scale length. Whereas for example, most Gibsons are 24 and three quarters. So that's four inches. That's like one, two, three, four. From the edge of this pickup all the way there, that's how much has been taken out of the scale length. So that means all your frets are closer together. And apparently Lennon used these tiny guitars to make himself look bigger. Or at least that's the urban legends that are out there. But the one that we're taking a look at today is the 64 variation, not the 58. This one has a slightly different pickguard assembly and it's made of all maple. They are semi-hollow guitars. And the only thing that breaks that whole all maple thing is the rosewood fretboard that Rickenbacker lacquers. Remember I was talking about this on the Tony Iommi SG and how it was such a big deal for Gibson to lacquer their fretboards? That's just commonplace on the Rickenbacker side of things. So we'll throw this one on the workbench to take an in-depth look at all of its specs, but there's one more thing I want to talk about this guy that really baffles me about the whole company of Rickenbacker. You are not allowed to know how much these guitars are. They they do not let dealers advertise how much they are. You have to specifically email them, call them, or ask them what the retail store price is. I don't understand it. So I asked a few dealers if they knew. Here's what the first one said. It's because they want you to appreciate the guitar. They don't want you shopping it around. If you're ready to buy, you're ready to buy. That answer really didn't make much sense for me. I appreciated the other answer. They might need to change the price of the guitar depending on the materials that they sourced or what type of labor is needed. Or it could just be because they want to avoid the internet trolls complaining about how much the guitar is. Initially, I was really hoping that I could teach you guys the real reason why Rickenbacker does this unique business practice, but I never heard back from them on my email inquiry. And since it's been, you know, two or three weeks, I don't think I'm hearing back from them, but it is kind of an interesting business model. But honestly, if I'm shopping for a guitar and I don't know how much it is, I'm not even gonna consider it. It's like a used car dealership. I absolutely hate it. When you go to those places, to buy a car and they don't have the prices in the windows. It's like, nope, I'm going to somewhere else that will tell me the price. 
but apparently these USA made Rickenbackers are very low production guitars. Now this is not 100% verified, but I've been told that they only make one model at a time. So sometimes you'll have to wait a whole year to get a brand new one. So maybe that's another reason why they don't advertise their price is they don't want to sell a boat ton of these. I really don't know. I just found that interesting. But since I'm not a dealer, I can tell you how much these things are brand new. They're $2,899. So let's go ahead and throw this one on the workbench and take an individual look at its parts and specs. All right, so I was kind of hoping that tearing this guitar apart would help me understand Rickenbackers, but if anything, I'm just even more confused now. Okay, so these toaster top pickups, that's what they call them because it looks like you're going to put a piece of toast in right here and toast them. Normally, on a pickup, you do not want to remove the middle ones because that's like the height adjustment springs. So I was going after these flathead ones and they weren't doing anything. But it turns out for these Rickenbackers, those are the two you want to remove if you're looking to raise the pickup. It appears to also set your pickup height as far as compressing it and letting it up because these other guys are just securing to a rubber grommet that does not actually secure into the guitar by any means. I believe all those end screws are doing is securing the cover to the top side of the pickup. But take a look at that pickup. That is interesting looking. It's got these six magnet bars sticking out of it and it is a single coil pickup despite kind of looking like a humbucker. I guess it kind of looks more like a mini humbucker, but these rubber grommets are so awful on the finish. You can see this is a brand new 2020 model and they've already eaten away at the finish, including the ones that the tremolo system sat on. But here's what the cavity route actually looks like for these pickups. Basically, the only thing that sits underneath it that needs that route are these little bars. And that's pretty much the same thing for the rest of these guys. I don't see any real construction differences. Oh, and that's interesting. So at the end of the neck, you actually have your truss rods sticking out. That's right, I said truss rods. This has two of them in it. I was not expecting to see them at the end. I figured they would have been capped off or something. Now that we've got those back into place, the bridge is kind of freaky. So I thought this was like all one unit, but what it is is you've got two tiny little flathead screws that secure this top part right there. So once you remove those, you can get rid of that. And then this starts to make a little bit more sense. This must be where the Schaller harmonica bridge kind of got its early starts. Because that's what this looks like. It's just a little bit skinnier than Gibson's harmonica bridge. I don't know. Do I have one of those? Yeah, there we go. The difference being that this just has regular saddles, is a little bit wider, but this is technically a roller bridge, so that's really good considering the fact that you do have a tremolo unit. As far as setting intonation, I believe you use those and going up and down, you use an Allen key on these. It's kind of a, a confusing, not very traditional bridge. I don't want to mess too much with this because once again, it was a new guitar day purchase. I don't want to ruin a guitar that I don't technically own. But if you get in there, it, it looks like it's secured by about three screws or so underneath that. But take a look at this carve. That is interesting. That's like a signature Rickenbacker type thing. And if you get it in the light just right, you can see the two piece seam line. Because this is very similar to like a Gibson style Vibrola that they used to put on the Melody Makers and stuff, where it's just a bent piece of metal that kind of slides on there. But this one has an additional piece of metal that it just slides in like that. And it pretty much locks the strings into place. But to take the bar on and off, you just unscrew this and then that comes off. There's a little washer and then you could just set it up without it. That's how it came from the factory, but I had to install this arm. And the arms just kind of got a sharp little bit here at the end. That's the flat part that you're supposed to use, I guess. But what I found incredibly fascinating is, look at our strap button. It is not secured by a screw. It's just the threaded inserts on the other side. You have to use something like I use the spanner tool in order to remove it. Now, apparently, if you want to upgrade to strap locks, Rickenbacker does sell like a conversion because this is like a threaded bolt instead of a screw going through your guitar. And I guess they have Schaller counterparts that you can do using the same width. So definitely some interesting stuff. So let me go over here. If you remove the pick guard, you're actually getting into the whole assembly right here. And you're going to notice we have five knobs. So what all do these knobs do? I'll be honest, <laughs> I'm not 100% sure. Once again, there is not a lot of information out there on Rickenbacker guitars, and half the information that I can find contradicts itself, and I haven't even plugged this thing in yet. So traditionally, on a two 
pick up Rickenbacker, here's what's normally going on. You've got your neck, middle, and bridge, same thing as what I normally demo. But this fifth knob is like a resistance thing because I guess the neck pickup overpowers the bridge pickup. So when you go from neck to bridge, this would seem a lot quieter. So traditionally what this guy did is it kind of tamed that neck pickup. And a lot of people apparently just rewire this as like a master volume or a bunch of different stuff. But these guys are your volumes and then these guys are your tones. So apparently that's switched from the Gibson variations. And you're also gonna notice that this three-way toggle switch is very long. That's the kind of switch that they use on a Gibson EDS 1275 double neck for switching between the necks. But since this is a three pickup guitar, so the neck position is actually the neck pickup and the middle pickup together. The middle position is all three of them. And then just the bridge position is just the bridge pickup. That's what it'll be if your Rick has not been modified and modifications are very popular. And if you're curious what the uh, ohm readings are, unfortunately I do not get any sort of reading that makes any sense to me, but maybe this will be helpful for someone to see. I do not actually see a brand on these or any type of ohm labeling on these, but I heard online they're supposed to be 500k pots. But something that's kind of strange about Rickenbackers that I've never really cared for too much just due to somebody could easily swap this out is their serial numbers are actually on the output jack plates. So 20 stands for 2020 and that's your serial number within that year. So I always just thought you know somebody can tamper that or swap that and make it whatever year they want but I was very impressed to see at least on this modern one they also have the serial number within here. So that was cool to see and we can also see the maple body here. And as far as our German carve right here, it looks like they just kind of layer up the wood right there so they can carve it away. And then the semi-hollow portion just kind of starts here. You've got this chamber right under there, and that goes pretty far deep in there. Then it looks like you just get your pickup wires coming through there, so it's definitely a semi-hollow body. But the next kind of cool thing here is the pick guard is actually a double decker. So this is just your main control plate, right? But then you've got this second pick guard, which once again has a bunch of rubber grommets over top of it. That's secure to the top of it right there. So you've got like a traditional standing up taller pick guard. And you know, that's kind of interesting. I mean, coming from the Gibson world, I think I would have been okay just with that. But what's fascinating is that it, this secures to the same screw holes there. There's not actually separate screws under there and then this secures to the top. That's actually securing to the body of the instrument. So it's all like within one unit. The only separate screw is actually right here. Moving on from the maple body, we've got a maple neck with a rosewood fretboard. As we talked about earlier, they do lacquer their rosewood fretboards and we just have dot inlays. There's no double dot, just single dots up and down the neck here. Now it's kind of interesting to me is it appears the frets are also covered over in lacquer. That's the way it feels to me. I mean, maybe the very tops, but at least the sides are definitely still covered in that. But I'm sure the neck specs have you guys curious. So it's 1.63 inch nut width and only 1.91 at the 12th. Keep in mind, it's usually around two. So that's definitely a smaller neck profile here. As far as thickness goes, it's pretty standard 0.91. And wow, that stays the same 0.91 at the 12th. And here's what that neck profile looks like. You can see it stays, you know, fairly consistent. It's just a little bit more rounded at the first fret. This looks to me like a 21 inch scale length, but online it was saying it was supposed to be 20 and three quarters. And the nut is made out of Bakelite. Now, for me, the thing that makes a Rickenbacker a Rickenbacker is the truss rod cover, more so than the headstock design. I mean, you remember the headstock design, but you remember this way more. But I would have never guessed that this is what sleeps underneath a Rickenbacker truss rod cover. So once again, we can see our dual truss rods. I've never messed with a guitar that had more than one. I'm sure this is superior in a different way. I do have to say that whatever this stuff is made out of, I saw the same phenomenon down here. It definitely reacts with their finish and does this orange peeling effect, and you can definitely feel that underneath this stuff. But thankfully, under normal circumstances, you never see that. Oh my goodness. I never, ever want to take another Rickenbacker apart. That was worse than a Floyd Rose to get back together. And I think it was mainly just because I was trying to put the original strings back on because they're still good. So the way this works, so you don't have to have the same frustrations that I do, 
is you got to take this little part off right here. You got those little flathead screwdrivers. They don't magnetize to even your magnetized screwdrivers. So they're a real pain in the butt. But once you take that off, then you take your strings and you're not actually trying to bend this down and then feed them in through there. What you have to do is feed them in through the side. And then if you're starting with fresh strings, I'm sure this is just fine and dandy, then you get it in there. And the hard part is you kind of have to kink the ball end in order for it to catch underneath there. Cause you can get it halfway and then it's gonna fling and hit your face. So you gotta make sure you get all the ball ends perfectly secure there. And then, you know, after that, it's just regular stuff. You tie it up at the top of the headstock. You bring it up to pitch. I suggest starting with like your middle strings and whatnot, just to kind of get some pressure on this bridge. So I think fresh strings, this wouldn't be so bad, but trying to retrofit the old strings, man, that took me about an hour and a half of frustration. But I think I got it. But what makes matters even worse, this is a black guitar, so it's gonna show fingerprints and smudges. It's chrome, it shows all the fingerprints and smudges. I'm trying to keep it as clean as humanly possible. But we've got this back together. Now it's time to flip over to the back side. Thankfully, I don't have anything else to take apart on this guy. Well, once again, you got your output jack on the side the special strap button that secures that tremolo unit. And the top button's the exact same style, so it's not just different for that bottom one. And there's no comfort cuts or anything, it's just a blocky guitar here. And take a look at this neck heel. That is one big chunky square right there. But then it just kind of tapers into this neck profile right here. And then I do like the tuners they used on these. They're a Klusen style, but it just says Rick Deluxe. That's pretty cool. I'm used to seeing those things say Gibson Deluxe. I don't know if this is just a Rickenbacker thing, but the nut is kind of sticking off the side of the neck, and you can also see where the truss rod cover is also a little bit too big. You can kind of see that a little bit on both sides. All said and done, this thing weighs 6 pounds, 7.9 ounces, so 6.5. Fairly lightweight, but not too lightweight. So let's go ahead and, uh, I guess, hear how this thing sounds. Three pickups, toasters, apparently these things are supposed to be super bright, and Rickenbackers just have a signature sound all of their own. Let's experience that together.
Now that we know all about the Rickenbacker 325 model, what are my final thoughts on this thing? First off, let's start with the tones. Now, when I was doing the demo, I didn't actually know what the pickups were doing. I was a little bit confused. So the neck position is these two pickups. The middle is all three of them. So I really did not make the most out of this fifth knob. There's a lot of different tonal opportunities that I could have got out of it that I didn't demo. And then the bridge pickup is just the bridge pickup. So within this position, it was a very full sound guitar. I'll be honest, I really liked it. I think that was my favorite position out of all of this. When I had read about an overpowering neck pickup, I was very intrigued by that. And I can definitely see what people are talking about, but it's not as apparent on these new ones as it is on the older vintage models. But all three pickups on, that kind of had an interesting chiminess to it. But that bridge was just ridiculously bright, which I didn't necessarily like for the cleans. I mean, sometimes that works. I mean, it's the Rickenbacker sound. But in distortion, that's when that thing really shined the most and the other two were kind of, eh, not so much. But Rickenbackers are definitely made to play clean. So if you're trying to do all that 60s British invasion stuff and other nice clean ditties, I think you're gonna like these guitars. How was the tuning stability? Because normally these tinier guitars, they're not the best. And this one, yeah, it, it was okay. I mean, once I had the strings all stretched in, it stayed in tune for the most part. The strings actually wanted to go sharp on me. But what I had more of issues with was the fret buzzing. I actually had to raise the action quite considerably to get rid of that. But it's not necessarily just all fret buzz either. Because you also get these sympathetic vibrations here. Because there's nothing, you know, clamping those down so they're not long enough to not make sounds. And then sometimes you get some buzzing against the brass saddles in here. So it's just kind of a noisy guitar acoustically. And not a lot of that really came through on the recording. That's just something that you'll notice as you're playing it. And as far as the tremolo, despite, you know, kind of looking like the Gibson variation that I'm more familiar with, this is definitely a superior design. I mean, I mean it carves in right there so it doesn't stick up off the body. And I do like the locking feature now that I understand it. You know, figuring this all out firsthand on my own, not, you know, looking up guides or anything. It was definitely a learning experience for me. I'd say the vibrato actually stays in tune pretty well. And then the next thing is the small size. It's not for me. I'm kind of a big guy. I think I'm like, what, 6'2"-ish? So I found this to be a little bit cramped for my playing style, but I'm not the best guitar player to begin with. But it wasn't ultra uncomfortable or anything. It's not like one of those peewee Les Pauls. So would I own one of these myself? Ah, eh, probably not. But I do have a newfound respect for Rickenbacker instruments and a new desire to kind of maybe see if I can hunt down a vintage version of one of these things. I think the problem is, is the old Rickenbackers are so ridiculously expensive because of the people that used them. So we'll probably just stick with these reissues for now, but who knows, maybe I'll find another hidden gem in the Rickenbacker world. So if you're a huge John Lennon fan, yeah, you're probably going to enjoy one of these. Before we go, let's go ahead and check it out under blacklight. Now, apparently Rickenbacker does not use a poly finish and they do not use a nitro finish. It's like something in between that's like a special CV finish or something. I didn't really read too much into that, but it does not look like this one's gonna glow for us at all. But let's check out that case. The case is actually pretty cool on this guy. I believe this is stylized after a vintage Rickenbacker case because the really rare bass that I did do a demo on had something similar. I can't remember if he said that was original or reissue though, so I could be wrong on that. We've got two locking latches on either side and a clasp in the middle. This is just a pretty basic handle. It's honestly not even padded at all. <laughs> but inside here, a beautiful blue interior. The body of the guitar just gets secured right there. You have this neck rest block that's pretty cushioned. And inside here sleeps some of your paperwork, including a Rickenbacker sticker. They give you a nice polished cloth. Believe me, you're gonna need that. <laughs> but you also get your warranty information and your two adjustment Allen wrenches. And you've got your case keys in here. But one thing I do need to say is why? This is a terrible fitting case. I mean, this has to be a custom case specifically for these tiny Rickenbackers. Why does it move this much? 
That is super unacceptable in my opinion. I think Rickenbacker should shrink these cases a little bit to make it a better form fit. Or maybe even extend this a little bit so it doesn't move up and down anymore. And as far as quality control goes on this guitar, I've heard a lot about how Rickenbackers are like the highest of the highest quality. But I'm just starting to believe that it's not possible to create a flawless guitar. Because I did find a few cosmetic issues. So there's actually a big chip off the side of the fretboard's lacquer right here. The other thing I saw is there's a small little scrape off of the back of the lithographed Rickenbacker logo. Basically what this is is a giant clear piece of plastic. And on the back they have that printed so it just shows through the clear plastic and that got scratched somehow. That's not a huge deal, but it's definitely there. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed taking a look at a Rickenbacker with me. This is the first one I've ever torn apart and it was definitely kind of fun. But if you're interested in buying a brand new guitar, I can usually get you a slight discount. You can check out my new guitar day program on my website, troglisguitarshow.com. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.